God of War left a huge impact on the industry when it arrived four years ago. This reinvention of Kratos struck a chord with audiences around the world and influenced developers in the creation of their own games. Since its release, fans have been anxiously awaiting the sequel, God of War Ragnarok, and that moment has finally arrived. But Ragnarok launches into a very different world. The PlayStation 5 has been on the market for two years, while PlayStation 4 is now firmly in last generation territory. Yet one of the developers recently noted that God of War Ragnarok is at its heart a PlayStation 4 game designed to push that platform to its limits. What we have is a significant evolution of the technology featured in God of War 2018. But if you're playing on PlayStation 5, the team has implemented a wide range of new features and enhancements specific to this version of the game. In this video, we're going to focus specifically on the PlayStation 5 version and examine all the new visual features you can expect. We'll also test performance across all of its visual modes and share our thoughts on the game as a whole. Let us commence. Much like the 2018 iteration, God of War Ragnarok begins from the moment the title screen first appears. Once you've dialed in your options, the game will smoothly transition directly to Kratos, pondering deeply before the player. There's a lot of action in store for you, but this opening shot does a great job showcasing the frankly absurd amount of detail poured into Kratos' model. Every edge is perfectly rounded off. Materials such as leather and fur exhibit a lifelike appearance, while light and shadow breathe extra realism into the scene. As the introduction continues, pay close attention to the clothing and weapons worn by each character. They move and jostle along with the animation, rarely clipping through the model, as is so common in many other games. There's a weight and heft to everything that helps ground them within this world. It's the sort of detail you typically only see in these high-end first-party releases. The game then kicks into a high-speed narrative-driven action scene, which has Kratos commandeering a sled pulled by a pair of powerful wolves. It is here that we're reminded of the team's fondness for seamless cinematic moments. The game effortlessly weaves between scripted cutscenes and player control. It should also be clear by now that if you've not played the prior game, you might be a little lost. But fortunately, they feature a recap right in the main menu, and impressively, even that uses a smooth, seamless transition as the camera pans over to the right to show you this video. Once the game is underway then, you might wonder what can you expect from this new installment when it comes to visuals. So before we dive into things such as the graphics modes, let's talk about that presentation. As mentioned, character modeling work is phenomenal throughout the game and across every single character and creature. But it's not just the designs themselves that shine, but the overall cutscene direction and animation work. From what I understand, these scenes are created using performance capture. That is, motion and facial movement of actors are captured and this data is used to build out each scene. While there are larger set piece driven scenes throughout, I was actually more impressed with the quality of the simple conversations between the various characters. The facial expressions and body language really bring them to life in a way that makes watching each scene fully engaging. You know who I am? Back before winter set in, there were some misunderstandings. Regrettable ones. But I think we all have a better idea of who we're dealing with. Now, what you did to his boys. Self-defense. And like the original, God of War Ragnarok is presented with a single unbroken shot. But this time there's a little trick. The game now features multiple playable characters. The seamless transition from Kratos to Atreus and then back to Kratos really picked my interest. You basically enter a cutscene as, say, Kratos. It's a seamless transition for the camera. And then as that cutscene comes to a close, the camera will then find its way back to Atreus instead, where control is restored to the player and the game continues. Of course, there's so much more to the presentation than characters alone, and that's where the world design comes into play. 
You'll visit a wide range of environments over the course of the game, and each one offers its own visual flavor. The strength of the Santa Monica team can be felt in the intricacies of each realm, something made possible via the game's structure. Essentially, it follows the same hub and spoke design of the prior game, rather than presenting a singular open world, which means that artists are able to build bespoke worlds suited to each piece of the overall narrative, rather than a more coherent, yet perhaps samey type of open world. It's in these areas that the game's improvement over its predecessor become most evident. First and foremost, the game's lighting model has received a significant overhaul, especially when it comes to indirect illumination. Yes, it's all pre-calculated and the time of day does not shift dynamically, but it does a much better job of approximating the behavior of light, the way it pours into enclosed spaces, illuminating the environment around Kratos, it tantalizes the senses. This is perhaps the single most impactful enhancement over the prior game. God of War 2018 is a beautiful title, no doubt, but indirectly lit environments often exhibit visible light leak and a host of other issues related to the lighting system. With God of War Ragnarok, the resolution of the pre-baked lighting is increased significantly and helps minimize light leaking as a result. This is then further augmented through the inclusion of screen space directional occlusion, a feature first included in the PC version of the prior game. SSDO is used to approximate a single bounce of indirect illumination in screen space, complete with color transfer. This helps better ground characters and objects within the environment and the lighting. Detail levels in general have received a significant boost. You'll explore richly decorated landscapes featuring ancient structures now withering beneath almost alien plant life while being treated with some rather dramatic large-scale vistas on occasion. Ragnarok is a very tightly directed game, however, relying exclusively on carefully crafted assets which are arranged and designed for each specific area within the world. This is one benefit of creating a more linear and constrained game versus something that's open world. This is further augmented with the inclusion of tessellation for PS5 users, which enable an increased level of detail within the ground surface, which combined with the more physically accurate materials produces far more detailed and realistic results. The snow deformation system also makes a return, and this time on PS5 the tessellation quality is increased over the prior game, allowing more detailed trails to form behind you as you navigate these snowy landscapes. The aftermath of a battle leaves trampled snow in its wake. And while we're here, check out this small detail. Light from the torch can be observed penetrating the mass of ice, scattering light beneath its surface. It's small touches like this that really stand out. And while we're on the topic of lighting, let's talk about reflections. In the prior game, I've always felt that the reflections were a weak point. Many areas rely on exceptionally low resolution cube maps in the prior game, while the implementation of screen space reflections always felt somewhat constrained, especially when it comes to water rendering, which is, I feel, a weak point with this title. God of War Ragnarok attempts to rectify this in a couple different ways. Firstly, while true hardware accelerated ray trace reflections are regrettably not featured in the game, it does instead utilize a solution that seems similar to what we saw in Mafia Definitive Edition, where rays are traced into a cube map with high quality lighting data baked into it to determine the most appropriate color, but they also trace into a more accurate version of the scene geometry to better determine the best cube map placement. We'll have more on settings later, but this specifically applies to the quality mode, and if we compare the two, you should see what I mean. On the quality side, the pillars more closely match the cube map and the SSR, whereas in performance mode there's an alignment issue as you can see. Furthermore, there's additional parallax within these cube map reflections in quality mode versus performance mode, and simply more reflective surfaces in general. This is then combined with an improved implementation of screen space reflections which now extend deeper into the reflective surface, producing a more pleasing result compared to the prior game. This flooded cavern in the wetlands is a perfect demonstration of all these techniques in action. The water is more visually pleasing with its turquoise surface, reflections more accurate, while light pours in from above illuminating the cavern. It's all much more dynamic and attractive to the eye. The return to Alfheim is equally impressive. You're given a new perspective on this environment compared to the last game, with these stunning vistas waiting for you around each corner. Gleaming crystalline structures pierce the thick air, creating volumes of scattered light contrasted against ornate surface designs. 
Whether taking in large-scale views or simply examining objects up close, the level of detail remains consistently high across the game. So thus far I've made a few comparisons with its predecessor, but I wanted to go a little bit deeper. And this is where things start to get interesting. There's a few points over the course of the game where you'll intersect with areas that were previously featured in the prior game, and this makes comparisons possible. Starting with the home of Kratos. From the introduction scene, the weather and time of day do differ slightly, but I feel the lighting here is a nice improvement. His home is more visually striking in the sequel with deeper shadows and a more defined silhouette. If we turn around and look across the field in front of his house, the surface of the snow is clearly more nuanced and the distant background features more trees and detail in general. There is no doubt, however, that it feels largely familiar from a technological standpoint, but even still, it's a beautiful game. Now, skipping ahead to Alfheim, you do at one point cross paths with the original game here as well. We can see that it has evolved under the control of the Light Elves, but the comparison is striking all the same. The improvements are certainly evident if you look closely, but I feel the original game holds up surprisingly well in this instance. Now going back and forth between the two games, I walked away with somewhat mixed feelings. On one hand, it doesn't necessarily feel like a gigantic leap forward from a pure technology standpoint, but the deeper you dive into this world, the more you'll begin to appreciate the assortment of technical enhancements that have been included this time around. At this point, you should have a pretty good idea how the visuals stack up between the two games, but what about last generation consoles versus PlayStation 5? This is a larger topic and we'll have a separate video comparing the two at launch, but based on my first impressions, the gap between the PS4 and PS5 version is less pronounced than, say, Horizon Forbidden West. Again, we'll have more on this shortly, but if you're worried about playing it on last gen consoles, don't be. It's a good version of the game. But this sort of brings into question the nature of it being a cross-gen release. And it's something I've been thinking about in regards to God of War. In the wake of recent 30 FPS releases such as A Plague Tale Requiem and Gotham Knights, there is something to be said for a cross-gen game and higher levels of performance, but in the case of God of War Ragnarok, it actually goes a lot further than this. In fact, more than just about any game I've played this year, Ragnarok feels unbelievably polished, even in its pre-release state. There are effectively no stutters, hitches, or any other weirdness in the game. I've encountered zero bugs or visual glitches and everything just feels polished to perfection. It may not be pushing the technological envelope, though it still looks fantastic, but the presentation is so perfectly realized and tightly put together, it's hard not to be impressed with the end result. So what does PlayStation 5 bring to the table then? To put it simply, polish and performance. Which is where the graphics modes come into play. When played on PlayStation 5, God of War Ragnarok features four unique graphics options, with two of these options locked behind display capabilities. So on a normal 60Hz TV, players will have access to a high quality mode and a performance mode. But when you pair it with a 120Hz capable TV, you also gain access to a 40 frames per second mode and an ultra high performance mode. And both of these are accessible whether you have VRR or not. So the big question here then is how do these modes actually differ and which one do I recommend? So let's begin with the game's default performance mode. I believe this will be the most commonly used mode in the game. Image quality here is excellent and the target frame rate is 60 frames per second. In comparison, the quality mode caps the frame rate at just 30 frames per second, but offers some improvements to the visuals. This mode renders at a full native 4K resolution, while performance mode instead uses dynamic resolution scaling ranging from 1440p up to native 4K. On average, however, pixel counts reveal that it spends most of its time in the 1872p range. What's new this time, however, is the inclusion of TAA with upsampling. This new TAAU solution helps even lower pixel counts appear suitably 4K by eye, and as a result, image quality is greatly improved over the prior game. But if you just put these two modes side by side, you may struggle to notice any actual changes. But if we instead flip back and forth between them, you should start to see the difference. For starters, the two modes feature completely different LOD settings. Distant detail exhibits additional detail in the quality mode that is absent in performance. 
The implementation is pretty smart though, as you're unlikely to perceive any sort of actual change without direct comparison such as this. It isn't as simple as calling objects from view or anything, the entire scene is carefully adjusted based on the selected setting. Looking at Kratos in this scene, if we pause the action and zoom in, we see a slight improvement in the overall fur quality, there's some changes to the shadows and ambient occlusion as well. The quality mode certainly offers an improvement, but they're very comparable. Now in this next scene, you might also notice that Kratos' axe has a proper shadow in quality mode, which is nice, and there are other visible differences across the background. Earlier, I did mention that there's a difference between the way cube map reflections work in these modes, but quality mode also has another excellent benefit, contact hardened shadows, which produce a variable with penumbra in shadow casting scenes. Note how in quality mode, the shadow is sharper at the origin point and more diffuse at a distance. So between the two modes, I'd have to give the nod to the 60 frames per second mode. The boost in image quality in quality mode doesn't really make up for the lower level of performance, and it's still comparable overall. The only real issue I could raise centers on motion blur. The shutter speed is not adjusted properly to match the higher frame rate, so the higher you go, the less pronounced the effect becomes. Before we explore the high performance modes, however, let me quickly discuss the performance information regarding these two modes. The news here is exceptionally positive. Now it should be unsurprising that the 30 frames per second quality mode delivers a stable 30 frames per second, but that's exactly what we get. It's completely locked, there's no visible stutters, and frame pacing is flawless. Of course, it's also 30 frames per second, so it's not entirely surprising that it reaches that target, right? But it's the performance mode that impresses a lot more. So for testing, I ran through a few different battles throughout the game, starting with the wetlands here. It's a relatively constrained environment, but there's some nice looking stuff going on and a fair few enemies on screen. Try as I might, no matter which move I used, I was unable to incur any performance hit. This represents the average battle you'll encounter throughout the game. I then jumped ahead to Alfheim, engaging elves in battle. This environment is a little larger and more visually complex, but once again, no matter what happened on screen, I was not able to produce any performance hiccups. The frame rate is 100% flawless throughout the entirety of this sequence. The same is true in every single other battle that I engaged in throughout my time with the game. The key here is that unlike the prior game, which launched with a highly unstable performance mode on PS4 Pro, God of War Ragnarok offers players a flawless performance mode. It aims for 60 frames per second, and that's exactly what you get. Thus, for most people, I'd have to recommend using this mode, specifically if you only have a 60Hz display. But of course, people will want to know more about the higher quality video modes. But before discussing them, let me raise a little caveat we still lack the ability to capture true 4K 120Hz video output. Thus, the maximum capture resolution for our footage is 1440p at 120Hz. Thus, we cannot fully showcase the image quality as you'll see it on a proper display. In terms of resolution then, the 40fps quality mode targets native 4K, but this time DRS is used and it can dip to 1800p at the lowest, but thankfully this is relatively uncommon from what I can tell. The high frame rate mode, however, is capped at 1440p output using TAAU to enhance its overall appearance. So the first question to answer then, how do these modes stack up visually against the 60Hz options? Well, the 30 and 40fps quality modes both seem to mostly share the same settings, with just a tiny advantage in favor of the 30fps mode. In comparison, the 60 and high frame rate options also share the exact same visual setup, with the only difference between them being resolution. Thus, I think it's fair to say that we're effectively just looking at two different unique modes here. Thus, if you have a 120Hz display, I recommend taking advantage of this. How about some additional comparisons then? Let's begin with the high performance mode then. These are perhaps the most interesting. Given that the visual quality between the performance mode and high performance mode seem to be effectively the same, what is the use case for each one and what kind of performance do you actually get? So the high frame rate mode basically just removes the 60 FPS cap and bottoms out the resolution at 1440p, allowing the frame rate to reach for 120 frames per second instead. The reality, however, is that we're mostly looking at performance between 80 to 90 frames per second in most scenarios, 
Yes, it can occasionally jump above or below this point, but by and large, this is what you'll get during average gameplay. Compared to the 60 frames per second mode, it is a significant jump in terms of input response and fluidity. However, there's a catch. While you can enable this mode on any 120Hz capable display, if your display does not support VRR, I would instead suggest sticking with the 60fps mode. The reason? Added judder without VRR. So while the frame rate will look faster for sure, it doesn't feel as fluid as it should. Of course, if you do have VRR capabilities in your display, this is easily my preferred graphical mode. It really shines at such a high frame rate, and honestly, it's unlikely we'd even have access to an option like this if not for the fact that it was a cross-gen release. So there are some benefits there. This mode is even more interesting when you consider the PS4 Pro version, which also has a performance mode, Again, we'll have more on that in an upcoming video, but basically you have a lot more detail, higher resolution, and more than double the frame rate here. Now, the 40 frames per second quality mode is a little less interesting data-wise, but the news is still overwhelmingly positive. Much like the 60 hertz quality and performance modes, the frame rate in this mode is completely locked. It sticks to 40 FPS and does not budge in my testing. This is a fantastic option for those that prefer the quality mode visual setup, but want a slight boost in fluidity. I'm extremely pleased to see this option becoming more common in modern games as of late, and in this case, it does not disappoint. Even better, this mode works great even without a VRR capable display, as it divides evenly into the 120Hz refresh rate. So what else does the PS5 bring to the table then? Well, certainly loading times are improved. While the game plays out seamlessly if you play straight through, there are loading screens when you load a saved game. And on PlayStation 5, these average around 10 seconds, which is at least 20 seconds faster than loading a save on the PS4 Pro. So it is an improvement, but not necessarily a game changer as we saw in titles such as Marvel's Spider-Man. Then of course there's the DualSense controller, which is used as you might expect. The controller feedback and the trigger use is all very well implemented and not distracting, but I wouldn't say it completely transforms the experience. It's just a nice improvement over the DualShock 4 on a PlayStation 4. And that kind of brings us back to the topic of cross-gen. God of War Ragnarok is unabashedly a PlayStation 4 game that has received an enhanced release on PS5. And overall, it works out pretty well, but my feelings on this are slightly mixed, especially compared to releases such as Horizon the Forbidden West. So obviously, as I've already touched on, the benefit of creating a cross-gen game on PS5 includes the ability to target very high levels of performance and polish. I'm relatively certain that a from-the-ground-up PS5 version of God of War would not deliver a completely locked 60 frames per second, let alone the 80 to 90 you get in the high performance mode. So in that sense, playing this on PS5 kind of feels like playing another multi-platform game on a gaming PC. It is fundamentally the same experience, but it's noticeably improved, which is a good thing. Yet when examining the overall game structure, I can't help but consider other possibilities. I wouldn't want to see God of War become an open world game, mind you, but there's a sense that all those little animations, crawl spaces, and tight squeezes kind of slow the overall pace down. Yes, I know, many of these are placed there just to keep the player in specific spaces during key combat moments, but I have to admit I'm not a huge fan of that specific design choice. Could they push the world design out a little further if it had been an exclusive? Would they even want to? There's really no way to know this, and pretending otherwise is just a fantasy, but still, it's something to think about. When it comes to visuals, though, I do feel that Ragnarok is a triumph overall. Yes, the experience is similar between all three consoles, but it's still one of the better looking games of its ilk on the market, and it certainly takes nice advantage of PlayStation 5. It's not a gigantic leap over the prior game, mind you, but it feels like a nice, natural evolution of what was previously achieved. So if you've decided to play it and are wondering which mode to use, let me spell out my thoughts on that situation as well. For users of the latest displays with HDMI 2.1 input, I would recommend trying the high frame rate mode first, as I feel this offers the best gameplay experience with 
relatively minor sacrifices overall. Yes, it's not as sharp, but it's still gorgeous, and the boost of frame rate is worth it in terms of overall game feel. The cool thing here is that if you have an older HDMI 2.0 display that only supports 1440p input at 120Hz, you could still conceivably use this mode without losing much in the way of image quality, again, provided your display is compatible with this. Now if you prefer the highest quality visuals and you have an HDMI 2.1 display, the 40fps mode is the way to go, as you get nearly all the benefits of the 30fps quality mode, but with significantly smoother performance overall. Now if these options aren't for you, or you don't have an HDMI 2.1 display, the normal 60Hz performance mode gets my vote, as it strikes a perfect balance between performance and image quality. It's remarkably stable and it looks great. The quality mode at 30fps though is perhaps the least appealing overall. Yes, the visual enhancements are certainly welcome, but they're not so significant as to warrant dropping all the way down to 30 frames per second. So yeah, that's pretty much what you can expect from God of War Ragnarok. Beyond the visuals, I greatly enjoyed my time with the game, and if you enjoyed the prior installment as well, this is basically more of that, but refined. The formula really hasn't changed that much, but it is a solid follow-up. I will certainly be curious to see where the team goes next though, but given the amount of time required to create a game like this, I suspect it'll be a long time before we see any new projects from Santa Monica. But with that, we've reached the end of our journey. Hopefully you found this interesting and useful. And if you want to enjoy the video at a higher quality to better understand how it might look on your TV, check out the Digital Foundry supporter program where you can get access to the original MP4s and of course, all the other benefits as well. That's all for now though, so thanks for watching.